Yes, it is, of course, because we have uh, record levels of employment, record low um, unemployment. We've rebuilt the public finances so that we now have a deficit down at 1.1% of GDP last year and our public debt falling sustainably uh, for the first time in a generation. Those are remarkable achievements and now we're building on them through increases in the national living wage, um, a programme of investment in our economy that we haven't seen for 40 years in terms of capital spending to prepare Britain for the challenges of the future. You rebuilt public finances and yet the benefit freeze will have swept 400,000 people into poverty by 2020. That's the IFS believing 10 million families will lose an average £420 a year. Child poverty, as you know, is headed to increase by 6% to a record high. 14 million people living in poverty, that's according to the UN uh, rapporteur. The school's budget is in crisis. Half of all teachers admit to having to buy food and clothes and soap to help poorer pupils. And the food bank charity, the Trussell Trust, report a 19% annual increase, 52% if you count the areas where universal credit has been rolled out. So I would put it to you that your priorities have been wrong. No, well, I wouldn't accept that. Um, the, the school's budget, for example, is at a record um, high, £43 billion. Pounds. Why are teachers Forward having to take money out of their whole for pockets then to fund pupils' food and clothes? Forward projections of poverty are notoriously um, unreliable. Uh, what I can tell you is that child poverty today is lower than it was in 2010. Now, that is not to be complacent. We've gone through a period when we have had to make some very, very difficult decisions and we have had a freeze on benefits that will end next year benefits will start to rise in line with the cost You've of living. You've got nearly 20% key... annual increase in people's use of food banks over the last the key... year that's not a projection the... that's a reality. The... the key to sustainably improving people's standards of living is getting them into work and then moving them up the income curve by increasing their skills uh, and, and getting them to move into better paid jobs and we've, we've got a remarkable track record on doing that. Do you accept, however, that Jeremy Corbyn has moved the dial on this, that he has been more alive to more people's genuine worries about public services, even if you think he's dangerous or if you think he's insubstantial, whatever your political view of him, he has recognised the inequality, he's recognised the dire poverty that a lot of people in this country face and he's speaking to them? Well, I, f first of all, I reject the idea that there are you know, vast numbers of people facing dire poverty in this country. 14 million, including to, I, the, I don't, to the UN I, rapporteur. I don't accept the UN rapporteur's report at all. I think that's a nonsense. Look around you. That is not what we see in, in this country. Of course, there are people struggling with the cost of living. I beg to differ. We're in Downing Street, so if I look around me, I'm not going to see a lot of poverty. But if I went to other parts of the country, I would see that poverty. We do see that poverty. Of course people are struggling with the cost of living. I understand that. But the, 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 the point here is that we're addressing these three things through getting to the root causes. Now, you asked me um, uh, about Jeremy Corbyn. I do think Jeremy Corbyn's uh, dangerous. But I've said many times, including um, last week at my speech at the Resolution Foundation that the populists, and Jeremy Corbyn's a populist, don't have the answers but they're good at identifying the problems. And the problem we've got is that for many people the theory of how a market economy is supposed to work in generating and distributing wealth is at odds with the practice that they're experiencing. And that is why we have got to ensure, those of us who believe, that a market economy is the way to deliver a prosperous future for Britain. We have got to make sure that that market economy is working in the way the textbooks tell us it will work, to deliver through competition the best deal for consumers and to distribute wealth in a way uh, that is fair. And, and to the extent that it's not working, we've got to evolve the system. Um, we'll see Theresa May step down on Friday as leader of the party. Is your plan to step down when she goes? I haven't made a decision about that yet. I'm waiting to see um, how the lineup looks uh, for the leadership contest. It's a crowded field, as you um, will have noticed. The important thing to me is that the things that I believe in uh, as important for the future uh, and the things that I think the Conservative Party has to be able to offer the British people are represented um, uh, in the leading candidates. You still haven't ruled yourself out? 
from standing? Not, it's, look, it's not my intention to stand in this leadership election. I know that I'm a divisive figure within the party because I've always been uh, very clear and open about my Your own my staff view don't even know if you're on, going to be standing to be Brexit. PM. Though. Well, that's good. It shows my security is good. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what, I, what, I'm, what I've said uh, before and I'll say again today is the important thing for me is not um, uh, about the individual, it's about the set of values and principles okay. and the approach to dealing with Brexit, to maintaining uh, fiscal responsibility and to the vision for the future of this country. Let's work out what that Brexit strategy is then. Um, presumably there are many that you have confidently ruled out anyone who said that they will leave without a deal on October the 31st? Yes, so I, it's very important for me that candidates articulate uh, a Brexit strategy that is real, that could be delivered. And uh, leaving on October 31st with or without a deal is not a practical proposition now because um, we have taken a chunk of time out for this process uh, and it would not be possible to leave with a deal because it wouldn't be possible to legislate in time and it would not be possible to leave without a deal because Parliament isn't going to allow it. Andrew Leadsom's talking about a managed exit or managed no deal. Could you embrace that as a Brexit strategy? Well, it isn't, it isn't going to happen. Um, Andrea Leadsom has been um, presenting this idea for quite a long time. The problem with it is that the Europeans will not engage with a proposal that does not address their principled concerns about the Irish border and includes the Irish backstop. What about a time-limited backstop of maybe five years as discussed with the EU? That was Matt Hancock's And as rejected strategy. by the EU. So that's I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously, a time-limited backstop um, would have been ideal. But, you know, Emily, with the greatest respect, if we could have got a time-limited backstop or an exit from the backstop, Theresa May wouldn't be standing down as Prime Minister. The withdrawal agreement bill would be going through Parliament now and everything would be rosy. Let's try another extension after October it, to, to find a better deal or a better Brexit strategy. I think that's the Michael Gove line. Is that something um, that you could conceive? Well, my, my challenge to all the candidates is explain to me how you will avoid becoming Theresa May Mark II stuck in a holding pattern and an extension of time to try to renegotiate when the EU have already said they've finished the negotiation and indeed they've disbanded their negotiating team um, strikes me as a not very um, auspicious policy. Um, the debate that we're having now is here. The debate is here in the UK about whether we are going to sign the withdrawal agreement or not and what kind of future relationship we then want to have. Because the European Union is willing to talk to us about the shape of the future relationship, the, the political declaration. Um, that is open for discussion. Could you support somebody, say, who has ruled out no deal but has smoked opium? Uh, to be honest, I personally don't really care what people have done uh, in the past. I care about their um, uh, strategic approach to Britain's future. Some Tory candidates suggest that no deal is still better than no Brexit. We as Democrats, we as parliamentarians, should be absolutely clear that we can't tolerate either of those outcomes. We have a solemn obligation to find a solution which avoids both of those outcomes, and that means, even at this late stage, a deal. It means people in Parliament having to stop pontificating, get off their high horses, and understand that we will all have to give up something to get to a deal that will work. We will all be grumpy about it, we'll all be dissatisfied, but in many ways that is the only way forward for the country. You're going to be attending the state banquet tonight with Donald Trump who suggested the next PM needs to send Nigel Farage in to do business with Brussels, pursue a no-deal Brexit if the EU don't give us what we want, and has endorsed Boris Johnson. Your response? Uh, that would not be my advice. Which bit of it? All of it. But might President Trump be correct when he throws his weight behind Boris Johnson that that is the Conservatives' best chance now of securing a deal with America, something with Europe, and fending off the threat of both Jeremy Corbyn and Nigel Farage? For you as a party, he's your best bet. Well, of course, 
colleagues um, when they're voting in Parliament and then members of the party when they're voting in the country will want to think about the um, strategy that the different candidates have put forward for managing Brexit, but they will also be looking at the candidates in terms of their ability to beat Jeremy Corbyn in a general election. That's a, uh, an essential characteristic uh, for a leader of the Conservative Party. So, of course, that will influence uh, thinking in the election. You prefer to have Boris Johnson rather than Jeremy Corbyn, presumably? Of course. So, would you say that there is a very high likelihood that Boris Johnson should be the next PM because he's the Conservatives' best weapon? Well, I'm clear that um, Boris Johnson is the favourite. Look at the bookies' uh, odds at the moment. Um, he's uh, uh, very well regarded by our membership. Um, I disagree with his approach to the Brexit problem. He hasn't, in my view, yet set out a realistic solution to managing Brexit. Saying we'll leave on the 31st of October, deal or no deal, is not an answer because we won't leave either with a proper deal or with no deal on the 31st of October. So candidates need to be honest about the situation we're in.